You're listening to TIP. On today's show, we have investment legend Ken Fisher. Ken's a multi-billionaire listed on the Forbes 400 and the founder and chairman of Fisher Investments. Ken is the longest contributor running portfolio strategies for Forbes magazine, and he was named one of the 30 most influential people in investment advisory by the Investment Advisor magazine. Ken's firm manages over $100 billion, and we could not be more humbled and honored to share some of his ideas with you today. So let's go ahead and dive in. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Preston Pish. And as always, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson. And like we said in the introduction, we got the one and only Ken Fisher with us today. Mr. Fisher, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be able to be on your show. Well, that is very kind of you. So, Ken, let's go ahead and jump into the first question here. Take us back to the old days. Why in the world did you start this little investment firm that now manages $100 billion today? When you ask how it is that I started the company, I was too stupid to know any better. Fact of the matter is I basically had staggered around for about 10 years trying to do all kinds of stuff in finance and did a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other, most of which never worked very well. My goal became increasingly over time to be just an investment advisor, asset manager. And in the process, I started with low expectations, which is good, and literally didn't have some great big vision. I'm, I'm at that point in time, mostly just trying to stay alive. And you did manage that for sure. I know you're a very modest person, Ken, but if I can ask you, what is the key? I don't know if there's just one key, but if you should mention some of the keys you had to success building your own company, what would that be? I think I've had a lot of advantages in life that a lot of other people don't have, although some people do. One of the biggest ones that I regularly cite is that I was a baby brother. Being a baby brother always made me think about all parts of life as the one that doesn't have the power, that doesn't have the experience, that doesn't have the size. And in my case, uh, my older siblings were just simply smarter than me. So that gave me another thing to cause me to think about how I had to think about things that I wanted, that I thought were good, that weren't more or less what my superior direct competition wanted. Because if I went up against my superior direct competition, which is most of the big players in the marketplace, I'd lose. That mindset, I think, is terribly important in my view. And it was my view then, not when I was a little kid growing up, but it was my view early in my professional career that for the most part, capital markets realm is full of people who display what more recently behavioralism has come to call overconfidence and that overconfidence impairs them. This is a realm where if you're the greatest in the world, you're still probably right no more than 70% of the time. And therefore, you better be used to being wrong a lot and be comfortable with it. So the other part is kind of being in some ways tough, like a boxer has to be tough. If you can't take a financial emotional punch, you're not going to survive doing this. So the one part is to not let your ego get in the way. The other part is to take a punch. And then I think the third part is to come to learn who you really are yourself, because capital markets are a very expensive place to learn that. They'll always be wanting to teach you that. I've long used the phrase that the markets are what I call the great humiliator, whose goal is to humiliate as many people as possible for as many dollars as possible for as long as time as possible. And the bigger and the more successful you are, the more the great humiliator wants to get you. The great humiliator does want to get you, wants to get your mother, wants to get your uh, kid. But more than anything else, the more successful and bigger you are, the more the great humiliator wants to get you. So you're always up against that. And there's an age old saying, which is that the market's a place where a person with experience gets some money and a person with money gets an experience. The fact of the matter is that's that part about knowing who you are. That's definitely true. Ken, $100 billion to manage, that's clearly a lot. But you also have the viewpoint that it's not a disadvantage. Which is really surprising because we often hear that from money managers that just a billion dollars might be a disadvantage to manage compared to 
what they used to. Could you please elaborate on that? I don't think there's many disadvantages at all. That view is common, but I think it's misunderstood. I don't have any money. A hundred billion dollars is peanut. I mean, I've got less than one tenth of one percent of the market that I address. Any way you measure it. And now, mind you, that could be different. Most of what we do is aimed at the world stock market. I mean, if I was trying to throw a hundred billion dollars at microcap stocks, it'd be impossible. But aimed at the world market, I'm a little peanut. The retail investor. If they sell short, don't get paid cash for that. They don't get interest on that. We do that for our customer. We do. Why? Because otherwise, we won't do it through that source. You use scale like a weapon. You want to use scale like it's a big club that you can beat the critters along the path over the head with. Why do you think there is this misconception, and why do you think so many money managers are talking about that as a disadvantage? Most people. Think of investing like a practice, like a doctor's practice or an architect's practice, where there's a set of skills you have, and you hone the skills in a specialty category. Like you're not just a doctor, but you're an orthopedic surgeon. And as the orthopedic surgeon, you really don't deal with people's noses; you deal with their ambulatory system. Now, when I think about that, most folks, in my opinion, Started off with a false assumption. I started off when I was young with the same false assumption. You come to like a certain kind of thing, and you think it's better, and you keep working on that thing. And that thing, which might be, for example, small cap stocks and being a small cap manager, it has limitations. You might think it's value. You, in your background, have been value oriented, and you think value is better. I think that's ridiculous. The fact of the matter is, I don't think anything's better. I think、uh, that's a statement that's anti-capitalistic. The fact of the matter is, growth, value, big, small categories like tech versus healthcare over very long time periods end up with nearly identical returns, and it's the last few years wiggles mostly that separate one above the other over the course of a long prior period. Yet most practitioners, they got this thing they like to do. And that thing slots them down into narrowness, and that narrowness does provide liquidity limitations onto them. But in reality, once you accept that in the long term, category A, B, C, L, Q, and W all end up with similar equity returns, then you end up thinking about the world and the whole world, and how you place yourself against the world at a moment of time. There's still liquidity constraints, but they're so much higher. Tax pretty broad category, but it's still got its limitations. Or being a small cap manager, or worse, where I started. I mean, when I was very young, what I did didn't even have a name, but it's what we today call small cap value. I was one of the first dozen firms in any institutional small cap value peer groups once upon a time. And in that era and that time, if that's what I was doing today, yeah, that'd have real limitations. But the fact is, I came to view over a period of time in a Markowitz-like sense that small cap value is just the portfolio management alternative in terms of mean variance optimization to big cap growth, and that the reason you should have small cap value in a portfolio is as an insurance policy against when big cap growth doesn't work, and that small cap growth was a portfolio insurance function against big cap value. And that U.S. is an insurance policy against the rest of the world, and the rest of the world's insurance policy against America. And that you think of the whole world, and then you say, relative to where we are now, based on everything that I can understand about how markets work, how should I be tilted compared to that world? What should I be overweighting? What should I be underweighting? What are the things that ought to work now? What are the things that shouldn't be working now? Then you build up what I call capital market science about that, the technology of how markets work. You then end up with heuristic biases, but you still use those to say we ought to be overweight this stuff and underweight that stuff, and you think in a kind of a global top-down basis, trying to not have a bias in favor or opposed to any one thing. But what that does is it gives you much greater liquidity. I think most practitioners get themselves slotted into these categories because they like them. Like maybe somebody that collects stamps or coins, they just like the stuff. People say stuff like, "What areas do you like the most?" Well, in the long term, I don't like any of them the most, other than the whole world, other than capitalism. It's kind of like saying, "Which of your kids do you love the most?" It's like you know, well, they're all different. So, Ken, your investing approach involves starting from the top down. You look at the global picture and then drill deeper into the micro. 
Talk to us about this approach. Sure. You first look at the whole world and you break it down into categories like U.S. versus other parts of the world. Simultaneously, you break it down into things like sectors, growth versus value, and big versus small, stuff like that. And then you say, based on where we are now, which parts of that should do best? And then you look within those for your stocks to select from. So you apply stock selection techniques sort of to the haystack once you've winnowed out most of it. As opposed to looking for needles in a haystack, your first part is trying to get rid of most of the haystack, even though you get rid of some needles with it. Let me give you a perfect example. Most people think the U.S. market has done better than the non-U.S. market of late. And the fact is, that's true if you look at the S&P 500 versus something like IFA or whatever. But if you extract technology out of all the sectors, then you find out that America's done pretty much exactly the same that Europe has over the last few years. It's almost identical. It's down to a rounding error. People don't think that way because they think of U.S. versus foreign only. And then people would say, as I often hear, why would I possibly invest outside of America when America's doing so much better than non-America? And the answer is because we are tech in America. American tech dominates global tech. Other than the tech, we're not really doing better. I mean, yeah, you could be American only if you were tech only. And again, that would be so concentrated that if you were wrong, you'd be dead. And then you say to yourself, okay, let's say I was American only. Then I'd have tech in there. Let's say I was American only and tech only. Now you get down to other questions like, well, is it time for big cap and small cap? And intuitively, in this period, big tech has done better than small categorically. So trying to fiddle around with little tech is kind of silly. But on the other hand, once you get down into really big tech, since really big is actually really big, because the dollar weighted average cap of the world is like $235 billion, once you get to that point, then you're really talking about a relatively few stocks to pick from. Now, then there's a time to apply stock picking to those relatively few stocks. But you've just taken this haystack and winnowed it down on simple notions like when's the time to do big, when's the time to do small. When's the time that tech should fit in? When's the time that tech shouldn't fit in? Then I've got my biases based on what I've learned in my life as to how I think that works. And I end up having those biases and I have to rethink all that stuff all the time. The simple fact is the way I would think about the world always is take the whole world and look at what it is and look at how it breaks down into these categories and then say, what are the categories that should be working now and why? And then once I've winnowed the world down to the categories that should be working, then I do my stock picking there. If I'm dead wrong and those categories don't work, what would be the parts that would work really well? Let me buy them knowing that I hope they actually lag. They're like my insurance policy. I always want to buy some stuff that does badly because if that stuff does badly, it means the things that I thought would do well did do well. You got to always have some counterbalance, a counterweight that will protect you if you're wrong. But you start with this top-down view, what is the world, what should do well now? You don't have to be a genius to know that traditionally in bull markets, as the bull market gets older and older and older, fewer and fewer stocks lead the market higher, that otherwise in the vernacular, breadth narrows. So you say to yourself, when you're at that stage where breadth should start narrowing, what should it narrow into? And you want to be overweight there. But once you're getting into the area that it should narrow into, if you think about it, the stock picking is picking among fewer and fewer stocks. That doesn't make the stock picking any less valid. Why do you want to go fishing in the whole lake when you know that 80% of the fish are over in one part of the lake? They might go to another part of the lake at a different time, kind of like in the morning, they like this part of the lake. And in the afternoon, they like that part of the lake. But you want to go where the fish are. You don't want to be fishing where the fish aren't, on the hopes that you might catch one big one out in the middle of nowhere. I'm curious about what you learned from this cycle with your long experience that you haven't really encountered before. If you think of this cycle, which is now 10 years old, more or less slicing in time in half the 21st century to date, that's also perfectly parallel to what you could view as the global deterioration of the news business. The news business really peaks in 1990, but it's going gangbusters through the 1990s into 2000 and really starts deteriorating after that tied to the internet. 
Since then, the news world has become much more what I would call stubborn to hold on to false stories. And that actually becomes a form of an arbitrage opportunity. These things start, they start saying them. They say them over and over again. Not all, not always, but sometimes blatantly wrong. And they keep going. And as they keep going, that keeps pushing people who don't know any better to keep believing that story. And as that goes on, you can bet against that. That's something that I don't really think existed much in prior cycles. In prior cycles, the news tended to follow reality. It didn't predict reality. It wasn't always right, but it tended to adapt better over time. And now I don't think it does. I'm not really sure, but that feature... You can see this, you know, I do a lot of things overseas. I spend a lot of time overseas. And in almost every country I'm aware of, all the major countries of Western Europe, this function is very siloed by country. That is inside the countries, Spain, Italy, Germany, a little bit less in Germany, but mostly in Germany, France. You come from Denmark, you know, with Borson, which is the greatest paper in Denmark, in my opinion, by far. This function of holding on to older ideas once you should have figured out they were just dead wrong. It keeps going, and I think it's an arbitrageable opportunity. Interesting. So in continuation of that question, I'm curious about the biggest change you've seen over the years in the stock market. So not just this cycle, but just over your investment career. The biggest change has been that technology has allowed pricing to uh, bifurcate. When I was very young, you had New York Stock Exchange fixed commission rates. Everything was very expensive. Today, there's things that are very inexpensive as a long-term result of May Day. But then you also have things that are very expensive. So we've got the whole world of two and 20 stuff. And then we've got the stuff that's discounted down to next to nothing and you know funds that you buy at very low basis points. That world is just average fees. I don't believe it budged at all. You hear a lot that fees are down. Fees aren't down. Fees have just spread out from the middle and pancaked. You've got these very high fees on one end, very low fees on the other end, and in the middle, there's less players. But that all just comes from technology. And saying that technology has been the biggest change over the last 40 years sounds trite to me, but it's true. Ken, I had the pleasure of reading your book, Beat the Crowd, and we'll definitely make sure to link to that in the show notes. It's a fantastic book. In that book, you talked about why we as investors should think differently. That's not the same as thinking opposite the market, or at least it's not necessarily the same as thinking opposite the market. What did you mean by that? Well, in its simplest sense, Stig, the conceptual framework of the market is that it pre-prices all widely known information. And I think probably all your viewers know that. If you take all widely known information and you agree with the consensus views on that, you're agreeing with what's been pre-priced and you can't possibly succeed. The notion of betting on what's been pre-priced is kind of mm, stupid. Then there's this other ilk that existed long, long, long ago, which would call itself contrarian. The fact is, in that vein, contrarianism was often thought of as if everybody believes something will happen, the reverse will. That also, to me, seems to be kind of uh, stupid. And by that, what I mean is markets pre-price, but with a wide variance around that. Think of it more like the face of a clock. If everybody thinks noon will happen, it doesn't mean that, it does mean that 12.30 and 11.30 won't happen. That's all been pre-priced. But three o'clock might happen and nine o'clock might happen or the reverse, six o'clock might happen. If you were just the contrarian and you could see that everybody thought noon was going to happen, you'd be wanting to bet on six. But in reality, three could happen, nine could happen. What the market pre-prices lets you know a bandwidth of the possibility spectrum that you should assume won't happen in the marketplace because it's been pre-priced. But outside of that bandwidth, anything else can happen. It helps you figure out correctly part of the possibility spectrum to refute, to repudiate, and then think of out of all the other possibilities, what's most likely, and that's where you go. Knowing, again, as I said earlier, you're going to be wrong a lot, so you got to be prepared for what to do if you're wrong. This is the reason why I don't bet too heavy, because if you bet too heavy and you're wrong, you die. You got to say to yourself all the time, here's what I think is going to happen, so here's where I place my bet. And if I'm dead wrong and all that stuff won't work, what would do really, really well then and let me own a little bit of that? Because I got to protect against being wrong. 
because I'm going to be wrong a lot. So keeping that in mind, Ken, I know you have some very interesting thoughts on big tech and who's buying into big tech at the moment. Could you please elaborate? For very basic reasons, this is a very long expansion. It is the kinds of stocks that people buy late in an expansion are different than what they do early in an expansion. What they typically buy late in an expansion is exactly what tech is at this moment in time. You know, if you think through the period after 2000 until 2009, tech lagged pretty much the whole way because it got too carried away before. It's not as carried away this time as it is then. But the fact is, this category, like all others, will have its day in the rain, and now it's having its day in the sun. This is a cyclical event that feels like it goes on for a long time because this expansion goes on for a long time, and the expansion goes on for a long time because the average annual returns are low, because the average annual growth rate of the world has been low in real GDP. There's a whole lot of reasons for that, but we've had this longer grinding, slow expansion, which has led to the longer grinding, joyless bull market. But late in a bull market, think of it like this. The new entrants into the late stages of bull market are people who were too afraid to own anything before. The things they buy that push the market toward its final top aren't the riskiest things in the world. They were too afraid to own anything before they were buying their initial stocks, and they want to buy things that they see as, for the future, leading names they know, things they know will be around in case they're wrong, things that feel like, even if I'm wrong, I can't go that wrong. So what do they buy? They buy the kind of growthy global names they know. In some different cycles, those could be parts of consumer staples. They could be in a different cycle, healthcare, drugs. But it's pretty common for them to be big, high-quality, growing tech because it's got that part where somebody can say, I can buy it and put it away for 10 years and I'll be fine, which is exactly what people thought in 1998 and 1999 as they were buying the then mega cap tech stocks, which actually were fundamentally sound companies pretty much. A lot of hot air in, in a lot of the little tech companies then but not in the big high quality ones. And yet, you know, for the next decade, the big high quality ones lag. The time when the little stocks and uh, things that might be thought of as riskier as a category tend to lead is coming out of the bottom of a bear market. And they do that coming out of the bottom of a bear market because the kind of people that are buying then are exactly the reverse of the late stage buyer. These are the people that are hard gut, steady as you go, looking for big wins willing to do it among companies that if the world was as bad as people once upon a time thought it might be in that recession and bear market, if the world was really that terrible, those companies try to go out of business and they get that big bounce. If you go back to the history of stuff like the work that Bonds did or Ibsen Sinkfeld, all the so-called small cap effect, all that comes off the bottom, the first 20% of five bull markets bouncing off the bear markets. You wipe those five out, and then the rest of history, big cap actually did better than small cap. You know, since the beginning of measured data, small has done better than big, but it's done it in these little bursts, which is the time categorically when small does better. It's the reverse of that late stage. The nature of the buyer pushing the market is the nature of a different kind of a buyer. But I don't think tech's secular at all. I mean, do I think technology as a fundamental underlying proposition in our culture will keep evolving and improving and providing benefits to human beings? Yes, I do. But the stocks move in erratic streaks, and I don't think that's going to change. We're going to have a bear market someday. And when that bear market comes, the categories that have led the most toward the end of this bull market will lag badly and early in the next bull market. Do you see a secular trend right now that is not appreciated by the market or highly underappreciated by the market? Every year for years now, when you get to the end of the year and you look at polls for what should happen to long-term interest rates, they always think long-term interest rates should go up, which was what they thought at the beginning of this year. And every one of those years, they've been wrong. And the same people keep being wrong over and over and over again. And they never stop and say, I must think about this wrong. Why am I thinking about this wrong? Now, actually, if you just kind of added globalism to it, Milton Friedman described exactly how to think about this when I was a kid. That function, the traditional concept of measuring 
long-term interest rates as a function of a real rate and inflation premium and measuring that against the growth of the broad quantity of money as a very simplistic structure is one you almost never hear anybody talk about. And Friedman would have said when I was a kid, did say, that central banks keep thinking they can deal with the world by fiddling around with interest rates, which they can't, but they'll keep doing it anyway. When I was a boy, there was a, well, boy, and I was in my mid-20s, there was a kind of a general concept every Wednesday when inflation was on the rise, the people would be fixated and focused on the, the weekly Fed release of the quantity of money numbers. Now, nobody looks at quantity of money numbers, hardly at all. And that part is one. There's so many people that kind of seem to think that excess debt is always the thing to be looking for. And I think that's almost never right. Could it be right sometimes? Yes. But this fixation is a form of a fixation. I'm just going to go off on a tangent for a second relative to your question. Another trend, if you think of Fathom correctly, there's clearly a bubble building that nobody sees in three intertangled categories. One of them is ESG. The other is infrastructure investing, which is, again, institutional in its nature. And the third is impact investing. And those three are entangled because different categorical buyers do them in different ways. That isn't in any imminent risk of that bubble blowing now, but when we get the next downturn, it will blow, and it'll make all things worse by about another trillion bucks, I'd guess. The trillion bucks is a round number, guess, not any kind of precision. But you can see a trillion bucks that's gone into that category stupidly. Right now, everything seems to me to be a pretty peachy keen world overall. So, Ken, earlier you mentioned that even the best investors might only be right 70% of the time. I'm curious... When have you been most certain about something that you were proven wrong about? I mean, in 2007, I did not see... So, so I think about that period differently than most people do. I am categorically of the view that the cause of it was Financial Accounting Standard Board rulings and International Accounting Standard Board rulings, FAS 156 and ISB 156, which is the mark-to-market accounting rules. Mark to market never should have been applied to that. It wiped two trillion bucks off of global bank's balance sheets in 12 months. That write down on the bank balance sheets was huge compared to actual problems with mortgages. If you just take the money value of mortgage default increase, it's something less than 10% over that period of the mark to mark accounting write downs caused by that. And when the banks have to write off their balance sheets by $2 trillion, they constrict their lending. And I missed that completely. I figured it out in October of 2018, and by then it's too late. What do you think is your main biases that you have as an investor? And knowing that, how do you guard yourself against them? Well, I think the answer to the latter part of your question is not very well. To the former part of your question, I pray at the altar of the high holyism, capitalism. Because I pray at the altar of the high holyism, and I believe capitalism is such a beneficial thing in our world, and the creator of almost all good things for humans, other than what you could think of otherwise as love. The reality of that is the representation of that is the ownership of equities. In the long term, the ownership of equities is a blessed thing because it's the ownership of the businesses that engage in capitalism. That could be owning these kind of businesses or those kind of businesses. And we've already been talking about there's a time to own this and a time to own that. My bias after this long pre-ramble is that you should always be bullish unless you've got a good reason to be bearish. And good reasons to be bearish are relatively far and few between. If you just think about what markets do, what markets do is they pre-price all widely known information. You know, if you can read about it in the papers and all like that and hear about stuff commonly that you can talk to your normal friends on the street with, you know, some agree, some disagree, they quibble, they squabble, but that's the stuff markets are pre-pricing. You got to see big, bad things that aren't pre-priced to justify going bearish. In my mind, that's possible, but it's non-trivial. So let me go at that a different direction. We got an 80 plus trillion dollar global GDP. In a relatively normal time like this, we're growing globally at about 3% a year real growth with some countries higher, most countries lower, but some of those countries that are higher are big. America's big, China's big. Forget about the exact number. I don't care what the exact number is. You get that real growth rate, and then you got a tiny little bit of inflation worldwide. You put that together, maybe that's nominal GDP growing at 4% a year. The 4% a year on $80 trillion GDP is $3 trillion of nominal GDP growth. So to turn that into recession, you got to have bad stuff that's bigger than three trillion bucks. 
you're not looking for little stuff. You get upset about a hundred billion here or there. That's, you know, you can add it all up with your adding machine, but it's just drops in the bucket. You got to have big, bad, ugly, and not pre-priced to take a bull market down. And so that's what you're looking for. It's not trivial. It's not getting all exercised because the Fed might do some stupid thing a little bit wrong, which I assume they do most of the time. The fact is you're looking for big and you're looking for bad and you're looking for not what everybody's been yakking about for a long time. And that's non-trivial. So my bias is to be bullish unless I've got a good reason to be bearish. And the way I try to protect myself is to keep looking for that big bad thing all the time. Ken, do you have many fans in the investing community, despite how humble you are about your own mistakes? And a lot of people have followed your career over the years. If I could put you on the spot and ask, what piece of advice would you like to pass on to the next generation of investors and why? The one that I just rendered actually is probably a pretty good one is you should be bullish unless you've got a really good reason to be bearish that other people don't have. You should really strive to come to know who you really are because the marketplace is an expensive place to learn it. You should spend a lot of time learning how markets really work. And looking at the total macro top-down view, in my view, rather than trying to be somebody seeking needles in a haystack, because when you're trying to seek needles in a haystack, what you mostly get is a lot of hay stuck in your clothes. You ought to presume, as I said earlier, that even if you're really, really as good as they get, which you probably aren't, you're still going to be wrong a lot. So you better be ready and be emotionally comfortable with what happens when you're wrong, because you're going to be. If you're just the greatest thing since sliced bread in capital markets, you're still going to be wrong a lot of the time. You better be ready to take a punch. That's part of knowing who you are. And finally, you know, that part I said before that I think I had a huge advantage being a baby brother. For those who aren't baby brothers or sisters, learning to think in terms of the fact that you're always up against competition, no matter how smart you are, the market's smarter that you got to be thinking about the fact that you're always up against a great humiliator. These are all fundamental, basic things. Ken, we truly can't thank you enough. What an honor to have you here. And I'm sure everyone listening is very thankful you took your precious time to share such valuable lessons. My pleasure. Honor to be on your show. All right. So at this point in time in the show, we play a question from the audience. And this question comes from Ahmed. Hello, Preston and Stig. Thank you very much for the information you provide on the podcast. I've been reading about factor investing for a while, and it really makes sense for me. And what it states is that an investor should consider various factors, such as growth, value, momentum, size, volatility, and and using it yields better returns and creates the alpha over the market. I would really like to know your insights and thoughts about factor investing. And thank you very much, guys. Great question, Ackman. So let's first define what factor investing is. So factor investing is when you have a large basket of stocks that all have something in common. And what they have in common is what you as an investor think will outperform the benchmark. So you might have a value factor, meaning that out of 1,000 stocks, you will invest in the 500 stocks with the lowest priced earnings, price to book, or whatever metric the ETF is set up to. You can have a ton of other factors like equal weight, small cap, growth, as you mentioned, and much more. Historically, factor investing has been profitable. For instance, an equal weighted S&P 500 index has outperformed the regular S&P 500 index by 1% to 2%. Uh, Value has outperformed closer to 2%. So yes, I generally like factor investing. The key here is really to understand where you are in the cycle and the drivers of the cycle. For instance, the Russell Value Index has underperformed the Russell Growth Index the past 12 years. As counterintuitive as this might sound, it makes me more likely to invest in value because growth performed better in a bull market. And we had a bull market for more than 10 years, and we know that value investing performs better in the bear market. So really to sum up, yes, I like factor investing, but only if you as an investor know the drivers of why and when the factors will work. All right, Ahmed, I can't add any further value to what Stig just said. I think he hit the nail on the head. So for asking such a great question, we have an online course called our Intrinsic Value Course that we're going to give you completely for free. Additionally, we have a filtering and momentum tool, which we call TIP Finance. We're going to give you a year-long subscription to TIP Finance completely for free. 
leave us a question at asktheinvestors.com. That's asktheinvestors.com. If you're interested in these tools, simply go to our website, theinvestorspodcast.com, and you can see right there in our top level navigation, there's links to TIP Finance and also the TIP Academy where you'd find the Intrinsic Value course. All right, guys, that was all that Preston and I had for this week's episode of the Investors Podcast. We see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see.